All right, so official welcome to you all um, to this Bad Girls of Poetry book party. We're so excited to celebrate All the Bad Girls Wear Russian Accents, the amazing new poetry chapbook by Jane Lushenetz. The readers today are going to take this bad girls theme in all sorts of directions, um, the sassy and the surprising, um, things that you might not expect to see um, from a bad girls theme, um, and I really can't wait to hear these poems. So I'm going to get started by introducing Jane to you, and then we're going to hear her read first. When I went to Poets Underground for the first time last May, this poet named Jane got up and performed some fantastic poems at the open mic, and I thought, I have to meet her. <laughs> it didn't take long for Jane Mushinitz to become my dear friend, and I'm constantly in awe of her creative energy and her generosity. In addition to being an incredible poet and performer, Jane is an incredible organizer and advocate for other poets an award-winning visual artist, an MIT grad, a mother, and more. She's a Ukrainian-born, Russian-speaking Jew who was granted asylum in the U.S. as a child refugee, and her debut chapbook, All the Bad Girls Wear Russian Accents, explores ideas of identity and home in poignant and sometimes very playful ways. I'm so excited for all of us that we get to celebrate with her and hear her read today. So please welcome Jane. Thank you, Katie. Katie Manning, everybody. Amazing friend, amazing poet, amazing advocate herself. That was a beautiful introduction. Welcome, everybody, to the virtual book launch party for All the Bad Girls Wear Russian Accents, my debut chat book. Uh, my name is Jane Mushness, and I am so delighted that you're joining me today. Uh, the book that just came out from Kelsey Books has been something that I never thought was going to happen, a lifelong dream of mine, but I just didn't know how to, uh, I didn't even know it was going to be poetry. I just knew that I wanted to be a writer from a young age, and I also didn't know how to make it happen. So the fact that it's here and out in the world is an incredible joy for me. For the next hour or so, we're going to be celebrating together by sharing and reading on the multifaceted theme of Bad Girls of Poetry. And I have Katie Manning to thank for the inspiration for that theme. It is delightful. I am thrilled to be joined not just by all of you in the audience, but by some of the talented and incredibly supportive writers who are inspiring to me in many ways and have been instrumental in the journey of this book and for me in my own personal growth as a writer and as a person. I will be introducing them later on. I just wanted to say that we got a chance to celebrate a couple of weeks ago here in San Diego and Katie encouraged me to do a virtual book launch, which <laughs> she then supported by actually hosting and enabling it. And I'm so delighted that it's giving me a chance to connect with people who couldn't be in San Diego locally and to have this opportunity to meet many of you virtually in person for the first time. So to kick off this wonderful Bad Girls of Poetry theme, I'm going to read the title poem from All the Bad Girls Wear Russian Accents. called All the Bad Girls Wear of Russian Accents. In the movies, villains have accents. Some German, but mostly Russian. Hard edge, lyrics of something forbidden, severe haircuts, steel blue eyes, and an appreciation for Tchaikovsky. For a black swan kind of life, for fairy tales built from curses. Say something in Russian, the boys beg me in school, hoping for death threats, nuclear arms codes, or at least a good cuss word or two. I answer, a bullet through every consonant, bare my teeth, on the V, exhale over that last ah, imply red lipstick. What does it mean? I don't tell them, only smile as they try to shape the unfamiliar with their mouths, repeating my mangled conviction over and over, laughing. 
They will shout it after me. I know from experience. Throw it out with pride for remembering the next time they see me. Maybe even use it as a perpetual greeting for the only Russian speaker they know. Which is why I won't teach them anything ugly. It will only be poured back over me later, a feedback loop quicker than some. Krasavitsa in Russian means gorgeous woman, which in the movies, all the best villains are. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm kicking us off with a bad girl theme on the cheeky and uplifting note, but bad doesn't always mean happy or silly. It can be taken in different directions. So I'm going to introduce the act one poets who will be reading Tara Lynn Massey, John Kozlowski, and Katie Manning will be reading. And Katie is going to be putting in the bios into the chat so that you can learn more about these highly accomplished, incredibly talented writers and poets. I just wanted to first say a couple of words about them, and I'm so happy to have them here with you. So Tara reached out to me because of a poem that was published in Mom Egg Review as a poem of the month. It's Lviv, Ukraine, and it is the opening poem of All the Bad Girls Wear Russian Accents. And that was the first experience I had someone connecting with my work and reaching out to me. It turned into this beautiful friendship and mentorship. Tara went on to encourage me in so many ways and also blurb my book, introduced me to John uh, Guzlowski, whose work is incredible and has been recognized and decorated. It supported so many authors. I was so honored to meet John through Tara. And then Katie, of course, you've just met. So these are people who I look up to and I'm very grateful for in my life. And I'm excited to hear them read on the theme of Bad Girls of Poetry. Should I get going? You get Come going, <laughs> sorry. Okay. I wanted to hold up this beautiful copy with a tassel that came with it. Um, so happy, it's a, it's a beautiful collection, um, inside and out. I love that your beautiful face is on the front cover. Tell your husband he did a great job with it. Um, you, you know, I'm very happy for you, thrilled. And very nice of you to do this party with, with extra people here. I mean, this is really your night. Um, and I, I was telling people before that I was gonna wear a party hat, but decided that didn't look too, uh, bad girlish, um, but thrilled for you. And I also want to acknowledge Marjorie Tesser, Mom Egg, for pulling Jane's poem in, and making it a poem of the month, which is what really, uh, I think, was the first step in her, you know, getting this book out. So uh, thank you, Marjorie, for that. I'm going to read, actually, I'm less of a poet and more of a prose writer. So I'm going to be reading a piece of flash fiction. It originally uh, did publish in counterexample poetics because some of my, my work sometimes kind of crosses into prose poetry. And uh, this, this is sort of the dawning of a bad girl rather than a bad girl story. It's called Those Shorts. We call him Mountain Man. He lives at the end of the road, not a mountain road, just a flat suburban one. We call him by this name because he sports one of those unkempt beards, wears flannel shirts, and keeps a junkyard dog that gets loose from its leash and terrorizes the neighborhood. When Sharon and I first moved to the street, he had a plastic shed in an old rusty 70s van in his drive and parked his working truck in the street. He is what we used to call a junk man, but today we call a hoarder. Over the years, stuff has accumulated in piles around his corner property. When the town asks him to clean up, he sorts the piles into like material 
and covers them with tarps and tents. I guess he thinks out of sight, out of mind. Now his yard looks like it's the burial ground for fallen mammoths and dinosaurs belly up to the elements or a grungy circus act. But the women love him, young women. You see them at his front door in their short shorts, sometimes see them leaving in the morning, head down and hair unstyled, clutching a coffee cup. We scratch our heads in wonder. Maybe the fact that he was a philosophy major, Sharon once posited. My daughter is starting to wear those shorts. They have become shorter over the past year. I think she keeps trimming the denim ones with Sharon's sewing scissors. It's the end of a hot summer that broke all sorts of heat wave records, and my daughter offers to walk the dog for the first time. She does this in her short shorts. And after several nights of her taking an hour instead of the usual 10 minutes, Sharon tells me to follow. We can't speak about our worry, we don't have to, but we both need to know. In the darkness that is creeping in earlier, I follow her bobbing flashlight beam and the slap and slide of her sandals on the gritty cement sidewalk. The crickets sing out as we pass the underbrush. A foggy sheen sticks to the lamp lights, moths flutter. Every light is on and the wooden front door is open to let the night air in through the screen. And there is my daughter, pausing in front of the house at the end of the road, the dog tugging on the leash, wanting to go on. Window lights spill out in square patterns that bend and mold themselves over the prehistoric mounds. I will step out of the shadows in a minute, my arm a rudder to guide her gently and silently back home to our house and to her mother. But in the space of time before I make that decision and her right foot with its pink and purple variegated toenails steps into the seductive yellow light, I give in to the knowledge that someday she will enter another door, maybe many doors, and that what she will find behind them will depend much on what Sharon and I can make of this humid night. The end. That was so beautiful. I loved the lyrical language of your writing. And Thank uh, you, Jane. <laughs> John. There are you I am. Hi. Uh, Thank you for having me here. And uh, I'm gonna read a couple of poems about my mother. Uh, I think my mother was a bad girl and a lot of uh, people in my neighborhood would have, would have thought that. I remember one time she and I were, were coming home from the supermarket. We lived in Chicago, inner city Chicago. And we, came, we were coming back from the supermarket and she was carrying two, um, two shopping bags. And uh, these, this gang guy, uh, ran up to her and grabbed grabbed the uh, grabbed one tried to grab her shopping bag, and she dropped the other shopping bag and hit him in the head with her fist, and knocked him to the ground. And as he crawled away, she kept kicking him. And across the street from from where we were, where where she was kicking this guy, all of the gang guys, fellow gang members, were sitting there, and he was crying for them to come over. And, and stop my mother, and they wouldn't come over. Uh, and uh, that's, that's the kind of person my mother was. She was a, a very strong, determined person. She had spent three years in a um, slave labor camp in Germany. And uh, I often, often thought that a lot of what she, she knew and felt came from her experiences in the camp. I'm gonna read two poems about her. The first one is called The Beats, and it's about uh, when she first arrived in the uh, slave labor camp. She arrived in uh, November, and uh, the snow was falling, and uh, she was sent out to uh, dig up the beets, uh, harvest the beets. Uh, here's the poem. My mother tells me of the beets she dug up in Germany. They were endless redder than roses gone bad in an early frost, redder than a grown man's kidney or heart. 
the first beat she remembers, she was alone in the field, alone uh, without her father or mother near, no sister even. They were all dead, left behind in Poland. The ground was wet and cold, but not soft. It was never soft. She ate the raw beet, even though she knew they would beat her. She says, sometimes she pretended she was deaf, stupid, crippled, or diseased with typhus or cholera, even with what the children called the French disease, anything to avoid the slap, the whip across her back, the leather fist in her face above her eye. If she could have given them her breasts to suck her womb to penetrate, she would have, just so they would not hurt her the way they hurt her sister and her mother and the baby. My mother wonders, what was her reward for living in such a world? It was not love or money. She wonders if God will remember her labors. She wonders if there is a God. Um, the second poem I want to read is a poem called What the War Taught Her. My mother learned that sex is bad. Men are worthless. It's always cold and there is never enough to eat. She learned that if you are stupid with your hands, you will not survive the winter, even if you survive the fall. She learned that only the young people survive the camps. The old ones are left in piles like worthless paper and babies are scarce like chickens and bread. She learned that the world is a broken place where no birds sing and even angels can't bear the sorrows God gives them. She learned that you don't pray your enemies will not torment you. You only pray that they will not kill you. Uh, thank you. It's so powerful and moving. I don't know how John does it. It just seems like the words he uses are so simple and somehow put together, they just mm -hmm. go straight to the heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I am next. Um, John, that was gorgeous. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I am going to share um, just one brief poem from uh, each of the last three collections that I have, um, one that isn't out yet, so sneak preview. Um, the first one is a poem from 28,065 Nights, which is a poem that I wrote uh, to and about my granny um, after she died. Uh, and so these prose poems, I think, explore how stories keep us alive. And one of the things I was talking about with Jane is how when we're young, we're sometimes told that we're bad girls, and that's something that's put on us. And then when we are grown um, or a growing bad girl is something that we claim for ourselves. And so I thought I would um, maybe play with that in the poems that I read. Katie, before you go on, I just wanted to say there was a request for louder in the oh, chat. Sure. Um, my throat is a little sore, so I will be as loud as I can. <laughs> but I'm a little hoarse today. So when your granny panties saved me. One time when I wet my pants at your house, I knew my mom would be mad. I was too old for this. You washed me up and put me in a pair of your underwear. The white briefs were baggy on my little body and made us both laugh when I ran through the house while we waited for my clothes to go through your yellowed washer and dryer. Then you got me dressed before my mom returned from work. You never said a word. I never forgot. I stood up at your funeral and told this story. The next poem I'm gonna read is a honeymoon poem and a strip poker poem. <laughs> and it's from How to Play. Um, and uh, apparently I write a lot of poems about underwear. I don't know. I didn't realize I was doing this until recently, so whatever. Um, this book is poems that were inspired by games. One way to use a deck of cards for John. 
How you were no good at poker. How you lost each sock, then your shirt, in our red room at the bed and breakfast. How the world was expanding. How we looked over photos of Prague with our host over pancakes the next morning. How we took turns trying on the words, we're married. How we puffed up hills, caught trolleys, ate sushi almost daily for a week. How we stood between a protest and free art. How a ticket for the movie we didn't like is still your bookmark after 15 years. How I look at you now over piles of clean laundry on our bed after our sons go to sleep. How I wish I could replace the laundry with a deck of cards and a smaller stack of clothes, the ones you're wearing now. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just replace laundry with strip poker? Yeah, that would be nice. So the last poem I'm gonna read is from this book that doesn't technically exist yet. It's my new book that's out next month with Agape Editions, and this is a printer proof, and I'm so excited about it. Um, and it's called Her Reverend. And in this book, I use the last chapter of each book of the Bible as a word bank. So I only use those words um, as the words to create each poem. Um, and I did this because I'm tired of people taking language from the Bible and using it as a weapon against other people. And so I am using that language as sort of a protest um, and creating art with it instead. So this is the one that comes from Lamentations. It's the Book of Laminate. We mothers are weary no more. We get our skin hot as an oven, violate princes with our music. Dancing has fallen to us because of our hearts. These things our eyes always forget. Thank you. Thank you for that. That is so fun. I love all your collections. I'm collecting them over time slowly and I can't wait. Uh, I'm actually going to be reading at Katie's virtual book launch for Her Reverend on Friday, April 21st at 6 p.m. Pacific time. So I'm looking forward to that. So that was act one. I hope you enjoyed our first three uh, readers. If you did, please share it in the chat. Give them a virtual round of applause. I am going to read another poem from my book, and it's called Stilettos Over Grass Plots. And the way this poem came about is a good friend of mine happened to go to a Russian funeral and asked me what the deal was with a tire. So it kind of brings in together a couple of the themes that have been discussed. One is a tire. It does not directly mention underwear, however, but it does talk about the different armor that we use to survive uh, as immigrants and strangers in a strange land. Stilettos over grass plots. I don't need a closet full of Gucci. There are only so many Russian funerals I'm required to attend. It's not disrespect or impracticality. That full-breasted, open-lipped eulogy wearing brand name sunglasses, carry groceries cross snow-laid banks to feed her ailing parents, tore open every artery to sharpen the blade of beauty. Migrating birds have their own kind of camouflage. My people wear stilettos over grass plots, outline tragedy with leopard print and lipstick. Lift up tombstones to label check if they're good enough to belong here. It's not necessary, I know, especially since we recognize our flock not by attire, but something more sinister than genuine leather. Something behind the eyes asking. Females of the species, what's the use of being a weapon and not knowing how to wield yourself? Thank you. I am now so excited to introduce act two. 
the readers in the section and Katie so kindly is including the bios for everybody in the chat. Please check those. We're going to start off today with Shyla Sheehan, Elizabeth McDuffie, Marjorie Tesser. Shyla, I am so excited. I got to meet in person at AWP last week. She chose, she, she's the editor of the Good Life Review, which is an amazing publication. And she chose my poem, uh, For Those of Us Forced to Flee, for the Honeybee Literary Prize this summer. And it is also included in this collection. I'm so, so thrilled and so thankful. And that's how she and I started talking and corresponding. Elizabeth was one of the first people who published me in Meet for Tea. This is the edition. I have a feel good about being a writer stack next to me in which places I first got published <laughs> is displayed. Uh, and Meet for Tea out this month. I have two poems in the Meet for Tea this month's edition as well. And Marjorie Tester, last but not least, Mom Egg Review, Murvox was close behind uh, Meet for Tea in publishing me. And I have five of the poems that were first published by you in this collection. So really <laughs> that is uh, the foundational underpinnings of uh, all the bad girls wear Russian accents. Thank you so much. Shyla, please start us off. Thanks, Jane, um, for that introduction. And um, thank you for inviting me to read um, and celebrate your new book. I'm very excited to be here and to meet everybody um, in the, in the um, book launch today. The first poem that I'm going to read is actually from Jane's book. Um, when I read the book, this is one of the poems that kind of resonated with me, so that's why I wanted to share it with you all today. It's called Babel, and the epigraph reads, when people had all one language, they said, let us build a tower to the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. God saw and said, behold, they have all one tongue, and this tower is only the beginning of their ambition. Let us confuse their language so they may not understand one another. Therefore, it was Babel, for the people no longer spoke the same tongue and dispersed over the earth. Genesis 11, 1 through 9. Remember when we all collectively agreed that we should eat greater than five servings of fruits and vegetables daily? It meant something, that common ground, even if in the end, we all ate uncomplicated carbs instead. Also daily walks, also fresh air, also birds and relationships and meaningful work and love, unloneliness, good deeds, gratitude, also breath, even, slow, deep. And yeah, maybe we didn't believe in God the same way, but we did share a sense of what was good, a common aspect articulating some unifying love of motherhood and apple pie, all of us pulling up our own bootstraps in one direction, up toward heaven, like a multilingual prayer. Our words unhinging from the dictionary's wooden thud, swarming into flight like bees, abandoning the hive collective. Things that we speak, things that remain unspoken. Within us, Honeycomb husks of truth and hope, still sweet and waxing on our tongues. Remember what we said we'd taste instead. Wonderful. <laughs> Just love that. All right, so before I read a couple of my own poems, my disclaimer is that I am pretty much the antithesis of a bad girl poet. I'm more of a goody two-shoes poet. So, um, I really only have one poem um, in my, you know, I guess in my history of poems I've written that that might qualify as a as a bad girl poem, and it's called "Call Me Poet." People call me sweet, but I'm not. I'm a word thirsty predator, and I will cut you and paste you and rearrange your face until it fits my own. Girl of many faces, they'll call me. They'll etch words into my gravestone, 
but I will not be there. I will not rest. I will hover around the earth, slip through eyes and ears and skin into minds and their plans, plant intentions, infest hearts with my incantations. I will rearrange souls. Soul breaker, they will call me. They will call me to come to their aid, weave my words to sway fate in their favor. But I owe them nothing, not even these words, unless it's the truth who I'm bound to by allegiance of my given name. That is totally bad girl. I don't know what you're saying. The line, I will cut you, I think kind of sets the tone. Amazing, thank you so much. Thanks. Um, and then let's see. Um, so this, Next one is called Speed of the Valley. Silicon Valley just doesn't understand. They don't even speak the same language. Caffeinated traffic moves so fast, every flat plastic scrap molded with the imprint of 16 digits gets used up quicker than the last. Tossed out like yesterday's takeout. Cut and pasted until nothing is left of the original right-sized and minimized into a system tray, archived to an external hard drive, never to be seen again. A landfill destiny in a disposable world. The sinewy rise and fall of each hot commodity forgotten faster than the last. Slow down the earthly turn, watch the rise and fall of your lover's chest at 2 a.m. The rise and fall of the night, your daughter and her first date the color of her dress and smile and blush. Some boy will break her heart or she'll break his. I've missed, missed too much already. And the last one I'm going to read um, kind of fits into that same theme of connection and language. Um, and it's called Mining the Gap. There is silence between us, and I have failed so far to find a word that you and I can agree on. I'm a landlocked lava rock, and you are open water. I'm a blooming flower, and you are stalactite. I'm a Bluetooth keyboard, and you're a ream of paper. We are juxtaposed and oblique, trying to navigate a sea of deaf space between us. I am traveling dictionaries to get to you, and I'm not giving up. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. It was amazing, and I really loved hearing the syncopation and the internal rhymes in some of your poems. I love hearing people read their work. It comes across so much more alive um, in, in such a different way than, it, than on the page itself. So. That was really fun. Elizabeth, you're up next. Hi. So I'm gonna share some pieces by friends of mine and then read one of mine. But this is from my friend Kristen Bach's collection, Glass Bikini, a 2021 release from Tupelo Press. And it's brilliant. And I have to take my glasses off. It's called Phantasmagoria. It's quieter here in the house. Fewer voices, just the occasional startle of melting snow falling from the eaves like bodies. They say all bodies are composed of gossamer films. Each time you photograph one, an actual layer of skin so thin you can't see it is removed and transferred to the photograph. Likewise, if you stare too long at a photo with longing in your heart, a spectral layer peels itself from the image and works its way like a worm into the eye, that sentinel organ between matter and spirit, between sleeping and waking. I wonder if that's why I dream of my dead father half in the past, half in the present, his artist eye wandering into a milky cloud of ectoplasm. Have I created these fibrous webs or have they created me? 
I've taken too many pictures of the cows in the back field. They look weak, thin, and seem to be fading into the snowpack. They say a woman in the throes of lovemaking must not look upon an image of a beast, not even a pastoral painting hanging by the bed, lest her child be born with hooves instead of hands. Inside me, a menagerie of cows. Once my lover, who died in a house fire, came to me in a dream. Eyelashes burned to the quick, ice blue eyes bluer than before. We talked. It's so quiet tonight, I hear the faint clatter of cow bells. Funny thing, there are no cows in the field, haven't been for years. They say our words, our actions, even our thoughts imprint on the picture gallery of the universe, a permanent record on a great canvas to be judged by a greater being. Are those stars or holes in the canvas shielding us from a terrible light? Sometimes when I'm sleeping, a voice barks at me from outside the dream, from the room I'm dreaming inside. It's so loud I wake with my hand on my ear, no body next to mine. All things shed themselves and recollect inside us. A cow, for example, is always emitting a transparent copy of itself, fluid-like, through the air and into the eye where it materializes into a tiny replica. In dreams, these films collide, mingle. All my dead merge into one hybrid body. There is a deep and constant lowing from the field. So get that book and a short one from my friend donna lynch her book girls from the county a 2022 release from raw dog screaming press and this was originally in an earlier book called witches um 2010 also the same press my grandmother the hunter could it be any colder out here in the wood Oh, grandmother, what shall we do? We'll chop up the birch and slaughter a deer. Dear child, we will make it through. Could it be any darker out here in the wood? Oh, grandmother, how will we see? We'll light up our torches and walk by the moon. Dear child, just follow my lead. Could they be any crueler, these ravenous wolves? Oh, gran, here they come for my bones. There's no need to cry. I'll skin them alive. Dear child, you're never alone. So get that book. And a short one for me to close. This might be more of like a bad girl's retirement. It's called nesting. I'm building a nest to call my home out of mussel shells and seagull bones. I'm building this home behind a dune. I'm sure back here there'll be plenty of room and shelter from sea breezes and tides. A lining of feathers keeps it warm inside. My children have all grown, and so this home is my very own. There's only room for me in my avian home by the sea. So here I'll live out my days till I am an ancient crone. I'll wander the shores by the light of day, searching and digging till I find the buried seal hide I know is mine. Then one day when I'm withered and frail, I'll slip the hide on and zip it right up and slide into the sea where my sulky sisters have been awaiting me. Thank you. That was fantastic. I love all the fairy tale elements that are threaded throughout all of the poems. It just feels like, oh, there's something to discover, a little <laughs> treasure just for me inside each one. Beautiful. <laughs> there are questions in the chat for you to please list the name of the presses and the books that you read from in the beginning. Marjorie, you're up. Hi, and uh, thank you, Jane, for having me. And thank you for your poems, which I was so pleased to publish. Uh, it's always exciting to discover a poet whose work you love. And um, I feel that way about yours. And thanks to all the other readers whose wonderful words just kind of buoyed me up <laughs> today and Katie for uh, arranging this reading. Um, and thanks also for proposing the theme of bad girls, because it kind of got me thinking as to who 
Do I, you know, what I thought of bad girls when I was younger was a certain imperviousness and veneer and toughness. And now kind of uh, what I think of as badass in a poet is a willingness to um, show some questioning and vulnerability as well as fearlessness. So I'm going to read one from Diane Seuss, which I, who is, I think, one of the most badass poets ever, and then a short one of mine. This is, uh, this was originally published in The Rumpus, and it's a sonnet. It's called My Favorite Scent is My Own Funk, My Least Favorite Scent, Other. My favorite scent is my own funk. My least favorite scent, other people's funk. And this, my friends, is why we cannot have nice things. I value the advice I give others, but I don't like the advice that comes my way unless it reflects what I would have done anyway. You know how it goes. I like how my voice sounds in the car when I sing along with earth, wind, and fire, but no one else can pull it off. No one. My bad acting when I acted was charming. I intended it to be bad as a comment on the state of theater in the 20th century. On days I don't have to see anyone, I don't brush my hair. I don't wear underwear or shoes or chemical potions meant to extinguish my funk. And in these times, I am nearly perfectly happy. If you're me, it's luxurious to go unobserved. When asked the inevitable question, whether I'd wear eyeliner if I was the last person on earth? No, hell no. Eyeliner is war. When I'm alone, I lay my weapons down. And now here's a kind of recent one of mine that harks back to the time when I was younger and wanted to look like a bad girl, but like Shyla, <laughs> probably wasn't quite as tough as I wanted to look. It's called Doing 69. When I was 12, my mother let me buy a trendy t-shirt the ringer kind, with a number smack across the chest, 69. I did know even then it had something to do with sex, although I was fuzzy on exactly what. I felt delicious, dangerous, striding down my Brooklyn street with my blatant badge, new breasts beneath, until a truck driver my dad's age leaned out his window to yell, 69, all right. Naive then, but still am to an extent, doing 69 worldly and innocent. Oh, I love how fun these poems are. And they brought back underwear. <laughs> Thank you so much. Are you done? Yes, I'm done. I'm done. Oh, I want more. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have more, but let's let's leave it at that. <laughs> well, I look forward uh, I look forward to more, and uh, if you can put in the chat if those are available for people to read and find, or where else they could find more. That was so entertaining. Um, I'm going to thank you all so much for your beautiful readings, and I'm going to wrap up with two short poems that are at the end of the book. And I've never read the last one at any reading because it's a little salacious, but I'm like, where else could I read it? I've been encouraged, especially by Marjorie, um, to go for it. So I will read the ending two poems of All the Bad Girls Wear Russian Accents, uh, Tea Smells Like Absolution, and Yevgenia, which is my given name. Tea smells like absolution, a cup too hot to drink, boiling amber rich and heavy as a Tsarina's dowry. Mine are a pale people who sing Black eyes drink black tea, greet the new year at midnight, spin tales of deep, dark forests, endless winters. Deathless wizards and endless cold. 
warm yourself by my fire. Tell me, what is your comfort food? Yevgenia. I am hard to pronounce. It's not just my name, which used to embarrass me as a child. But now, I don't mind that before you get to know me, you have to consider how your tongue should bend, whether your teeth should click or your throat constrict around me. You may want to call me silently at first, testing out the Cyrillic of my syllables inside the intimate privacy of your imagination. That's okay. I'm imagining you too. Thank you so much, everybody. If you have comments or questions, you can put them in the chat. Katie, if you can jump on and let us know what the uh, recording session. Uh, so I am jumping on to say, thank you, Jane, you are amazing. So please, you are welcome to unmute and clap or put all of your um, things in the chat that are celebratory or yes, do your hands and hearts and all the things. Um, I'm gonna put the link to Jane's book page in the chat. Um, you can order from the publisher. You can also order from Jane and get a signed copy. So all of that information is in the link on Jane's website. Um, I am going to end the recording here, but stick around for a moment. And if you're willing, we can unmute our videos and take a screenshot, which is the best kind of selfie type thing I can do virtually. Um, but thank you all for being here. Thank you, Jane. You are fantastic. Um, and we will stick around for a little bit of an after party if you want to ask questions or just, you know, hang out. So let me officially stop the recording. Farewell to anyone watching this later. Thank you. For Thank watching. you. Thank you so much.